Okay, hello, good morning, or good afternoon everyone. My name is Cheryl Pula, and I'll be doing a program this afternoon on the Battle of Oriskany, which occurred on August 6, 1777, and according to many historians, was the turning point of the American Revolution. So, by the summer of 1777, the American colonies had been in rebellion against Great Britain since April 1775. Uh, which of course was when the Battle of Lexington and Concord occurred. Um, getting tired, if you will, of this whole rebellion thing, the British decided it was time to do something. So General John Burgoyne uh, decided to separate the northern colonies from those in the south, as it was the northern colonies who had actually uh, begun the whole thing at Lexington and Concord, and were communicating with the southern colonies and inciting them to rebellion also. So they figured the best thing to do was to uh, break the colonies in half, if you will, separate the north from the south. Burgoyne came up with a plan, which we call the three-way plan. And in that plan, he would be up in Canada. He would come down uh, from Canada to Albany uh, via like Lake Champlain, Lake George area. Uh, General William Howe would come up from New York through the Hudson Valley and Barry St. Ledger would come east from Lake Ontario through the Mohawk Valley. They would meet in Albany and cut the colonies in half so they couldn't communicate with each other anymore and quash the rebellion. Now, several years before, there was a thing called the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, and that delineated the boundary between the British colonies and those uh, lands that had been given, or if you will, still occupied by the Native American tribes. And that was called the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. And the line for this treaty went right up through what is like modern day Oneida County, Madison County, that area there. So Onondaga County would have been in the land still ceded to the Native Americans, where the county that I'm from, Oneida County, which at the time was called Tryon County, um, was ceded to the British Colonials. And the idea was that the colonies could not spread past this uh, line of demarcation from the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. The main native uh, contingent, if you will, were the Mohawks, and they were led by a guy named Theena de Nagea, or Joseph Brandt, as we know him. Uh, he was born in the Oneida County, somewhere along the Cuyahoga River, uh, the modern Cuyahoga River, which we're not sure where. Um, Every year the Mohawks would migrate, if you will, from central New York to the, what is now Ohio and then back again with the seasons. And he was born when the Mohawks were out there in, uh, in Ohio. So, um, he was a main member of the Anglican Church, which is like the Church of England, because his parents uh, were Peter, uh, who was a colonist, and Margaret, who was a Mohawk Indian. And they settled in Canajahari, down in the valley, uh, to the west of Albany, to the east of Utica. And where Brandt grew up was settled in the early 18th century by immigrants from Germany known as the Palatines. Now the relations between the Palatine Germans and the Mohawks were quite friendly. And Brandt grew up surrounded by people speaking Mohawk, German, and English. So he learned all of those so he could communicate with them. Uh, the Mohawk surname Brandt was an, actually an Anglicanized version of the common German surname Brandt, spelled with a D, B-R-A-N-D-T, instead of without the T. In fact, if you go to Canada uh, today, Brantford, Ontario, is named after Joseph Brandt. Now, by the time he was about 15, he served in the Brit with the British in the French and Indian War. A lot of people don't remember, there was also a British officer who served with the British Army during the French and Indian War, and his name was George Washington, who was, at that time, a British officer. Right? Brandt was one of 182 Native American warriors who were awarded a silver medal from the British for his service, and Sir William Johnson, who was the Indian agent for the natives in the New York colony, and he lived near Johnstown, New York, uh, down in the valley, and he arranged for Brandt to be educated at Eliezer Wheelock's Morse Indian Charity School in Connecticut. And that was the forerunner of Dartmouth College, which was later established in New Hampshire. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that Dartmouth and several other colleges, including Hamilton and Clinton, New York, 
were founded as schools for the Native Americans. Okay? So Brandt learned, of course, to read, speak, and write English, because he uh, knew the language, studied other academic subjects, not just languages, and while he was at school, he met a guy named Samuel Kirkland, who was a reverend and later a missionary to all the Native Americans in western New York, and he's the one that the town of Kirkland, uh, where Clinton is, uh, was named for. So Johnson wanted to prepare Brandt to attend King's College in New York, and he was named the war chief uh, and the Mohawk's primary spokesman because he could speak both you know, English, Mohawk, and German. And he lived in Oswego, where he worked as a translator, then moved back to Canajoharie, and owned about eight acres of land, though it was not clear who worked it. We say that because at the time, slavery was legal in the New York colonies, as it was in all the colonies. Uh, and there were Native American tribes who had slaves, and we believe Brandt might have been one of them, but we're not sure. There's no historic record, so we can't say for sure. Um, he also spoke, in addition to English, German, uh, in German, possibly all of the Six Nations Iroquois languages. So he goes to German flats down in the valley um, east of Herkimer to discuss this growing crisis with the colonials. And he felt that a lot of the heat, fear, and hostility of the white settlers of Tryon County uh, was responsible for a lot of their wanting to side with the colonials in the war rather than on the side of Mother England. So Guy Johnson, one of the relatives of William, suggested Brandt go to Canada, saying that his life might be in danger. So Brandt moves up north to Quebec. Now up there, there's Sir Guy, uh, Guy Carleton. He was the leader of the British forces uh, around Lake Champlain and southern Canada. And he was going to be the guy to lead the northern prong of the street prong attack of the British, but Burgoyne didn't think he was capable enough. So uh, he decided to take Carleton's place. So Burgoyne was going to be the one to uh, lead this northern uh, campaign against the colonies. Okay? So Guy Johnson uh, takes Brandt to London to solicit support from the government. He hoped to persuade the Crown to address the past Mohawk land grievances in exchange for participation as allies in the impending war. So Brandt meets George III, then King of England, and um, he also talks with George Germain, who was the most important colonial secretary that the British had. Brandt, once he gets to England, is invited to St. James Palace, the home of the King, and in England he's treated as a celebrity. Uh, while he's in public, he dresses in traditional Mohawk garb, and he becomes a mason, of all things, and he gets his ritual Masonic apron from the king in person. Okay. So he comes back to the American colonies in July 1776, which is interesting, since that's the same uh, date and year that we uh, uh, declared independence from Great Britain. And he participates with the British forces who are trying to retake the colony of New York. And Brandt goes around asking all the native tribes to fight for the crown. Most of the Indians favored neutrality. They didn't want any part in what they thought saw was a war between two white peoples, the American colonists and the British. And Brandt tells them, look, I talked to the King of England, and he said, if we win the war, we meaning the British, the Indians will get to keep their native lands. However, if the American colonists win, the uh, natives will be kicked off their lands and they'll be appropriated for the colonials. Okay? So he decided that uh, being neutral was not an option. They had to fight for the British. Um, so he tried to persuade the Native Americans to do this also. And he said it didn't bode well for Indian rights if the Americans should win. So, he goes around and he recruits some volunteers, um, and the Six Nations, the Iroquois Nations, decided on neutrality in 1775. Uh, they considered him a leader of the Mohawks, and decided, said, you know, if the Mohawks want to go to war against the Americans, fine, we're going to remain neutral. So he was successful in recruiting some loyalists, loyalists beginning, being people who wanted to remain loyal to England, and who wished to retaliate against the American colonists, and they became known as Brandt's Volunteers. 
They consisted of a few Mohawks and Tuscarora warriors, Tuscarora being another Iroquois nation, and 80 white loyalists. The majority of the men and Brandt's volunteers were white, not Native Americans. Brandt goes to Unadilla, same name today, Unadilla, and there he meets with 380 men of the Tryon County Militia, uh, the current Oneida County, Hamilton County, Herkimer County, and several others. And this country militia is led by a guy named Nicholas Herkimer. Uh, actually, Nicholas Heimer was his real name. He was the son of a Palatine German immigrant uh, who had been born around German flats. His brother was a loyalist captain. He was loyal to the British. His name was Joost Herkimer. And Nicholas could speak German, English, and Mohawk, just like Brandt could. So they meet at Unadilla. And Herkimer had served in the French and Indian War and was involved in the defense of German Flats, his hometown, during that war. He made captain of the militia in 1758, and his home is still there. It's near uh, present-day Little Falls. Uh, you can visit it. He did hold slaves. Uh, like I said, slavery was legal in New York at the time. It wasn't abolished in New York State until around 1836. So from July to August, Herkimer heads the Tryon County Committee of Safety. He became a colonel in the militia. And after the split with the Loyalist militia, who was kept, of course, by his brother, uh, he was commissioned a general in the Tryon County Militia by the Provincial Congress in 1776. So what happens is, on June 27, 1777, Herkimer asked the Mohawks, Brandt, to remain neutral. And Brandt said they owed their allegiance to the king because he promised they could keep their lands. Now, Herkimer, of course, had once been Brandt's neighbor and friend. And his chief of staff, a guy named Colonel Ebenezer Cox, continued to make racial remarks, if you will, during this conference, which caused Brandt's warriors to reach for their weapons. Brandt and Herkimer diffused the situation, though. Uh, Brandt asked his warriors to go outside while Herkimer had Cox leave the room so he couldn't make any more comments. And Herkimer again requested the Iroquois remain neutral, and Brandt again reiterated their stance that the Indians loathed loyalty to the king. And he said that the Europeans, meaning the American settlers, ultimately wanted to evict the Indians from their territory. So what did the Indians eventually do? Well, the Six Nation Council decided to abandon neutrality and enter the war on the side of the British. Four of the Six Nations decided to do this. Some of the Oneida and Tuscarora decided to ally with the Americans. Uh, Brandt was sad by this because now he knew there was a permanent division between the Six Nations. So Sayan Quirahanka and Corn Planter were named war chiefs of the Confederacy. They were two of the chiefs of the uh, Tuscarora and uh, some of the others. And the Mohawk had earlier made Brandt their war chief, also a guy named John de Sorrento. Okay? So Corn Planter and Sayan Quaracta became uh, allied with the British uh, against Brandt, uh, with Brandt and the other members. Now, at this time, there were six nations of the Iroquois, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Tuscarora, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. Corn Planter and Sandaraqua were from the Cayuga and Onondaga. The, the Oneidas were represented um, on the other side with, uh, with General Herkimer, the Oneida and the Tuscarora, so that meant that the Mohawks, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, and the Senecas were all on the British side. Now, Molly Brandt, who was the sister of Joseph Brandt, was married to uh, Sir William Johnson, who was the British Superintendent of Indian Affairs in the province of New York. Their home is still there, uh, down in Johnstown, uh, Johnstown uh, at Johnson Hall, down in the valley, just uh, east of Herkimer. And uh, they had several children, eight, actually, uh, with each other. In 1753, to go back a little bit, uh, Relations between the Iroquois League and the British had become badly strained because the British were also starting to seize land belonging to the Iroquois. Uh, led by a chief named Theonodakwin, known to the British as Hendrick Peters, 
Um, a delegation went to Albany to talk to George Clinton, who was the governor of the province of New York, to find out what could be done. And they formed the Committee of Public Safety in 1774. Uh, Sir William Johnson became the leader of the Indian Affairs around Tryon County. Uh, they led the colonists to conform uh, to form a Committee of Public Safety to keep peace between them and the natives, if you will. And um, they also were there to, because the British were concerned about a boycott that the colonials had started uh, uh, from buying British goods. So they wanted to get rid of that boycott. The real purpose, however, was to challenge the power of the Johnson family in the Tryon County, because a lot of the colonists didn't like the Johnsons because, because they saw them, obviously, as agents and puppets of the British. So, I mentioned Burgoyne was going to come down from Canada to Albany. He was to meet a guy named Barry St. Ledger, who was going to go to Canada, sail down the St. Lawrence River to uh, Lake Ontario, get a force of loyalists and uh, Hessians, who were German mercenaries and Indians, and push east through the Mohawk Valley and get to Albany to join up with, uh, with Burgoyne. So, there was an Indian agent traveling with St. Ledger, his name was Daniel Klaus, and he convinced St. Ledger that he should stop at Oswego where he could recruit some Indians for his force. So he sailed down the St. Lawrence River, uh, St. Ledger did, through Lake Ontario to what is at the, was at the time Fort Oswego, um, which later became Fort Ontario, which is still there, but it was Fort Oswego at the time. They arrived there on July 14, 1777, where Brant was waiting for them with about 800 Indian recruits to join St. Ledger's force, mainly Mohawks and Senecas, but also some from other tribes, you know, the Onondagas and that, and a few from the Oneidas and Tuscaroras, but they said that they were neutral, even though the other Oneidas and Tuscaroras were on the side of the colonists. Some had come all the way from the Great Lakes area, remember Ohio and that area in there. He had about 300 regular soldiers, supported by a number of artillerymen, 80 Jager, which were German missionaries from hesse Hanau in Germany, we call them Hessians, 650 Canadians, and 1,000 Indians led by John Butler, they were called Butler's Rangers. Okay? So they were like a guerrilla force, if you will. Um, they also had a loyalist regiment <clears throat> of American colonists who remained loyal to the British, and they were called Johnson's Loyal Greens Regiment, or the Gro Royal Greens for short. St. Ledger uh, considered these forces uh, adequate for taking Fort Stanwix. Fort Stanwix, in what is now Rome, was the only major impediment between St. Ledger and Albany. So we knew we had to take that from the defenders. The latest intelligence um, told him the fort was not a good repair. So he left Montreal on June 23rd, comes down to Fort Ontario, um, and decides when he gets there, based on intelligence, um, that the fort is now manned in force by um, a garrison of troops, about 750. Um, He's also told that the fort has been repaired. There's about 600 men there, maybe 700 men uh, garrisoning it. And the, he knew by this time the rebels, the Americans, had gotten word that St. Ledger was coming. So he had St. Ledger has 900 men, the Royal Greens, commanded by John Johnson, uh, Tories under John Butler, and a thousand Iroquois under Joseph Brandt. Okay. They leave Fort Oswego. And St. Ledger gets a report that there are supplies en route to Fort Stanwix. Uh, the main force is moving up what is called Woods Creek, that's the American force, to land on the eastern shore of what is now Lake Oneida and to reinforce Fort Stanwix. So he knows he has to get there before they can be reinforced. So while they go, St. Ledger's force are rebuilding an old military road that leads to Fort Stanwix. He sends Brandt and 200 Indians to intercept this reinforcement column that he hears is going to Fort Stanwix. 
Brandt arrives on August 2nd in the vicinity of what is now Oriskany. At the time it was Oriska, a Native American village, but he gets there too late. The, forces, the fort has already been reinforced and resupplied. The supplies have been delivered to Fort Stamps, but then by the 9th Massachusetts Regiment, they arrive, they unload, and they decide after they hear there's a British force coming to, you know, pres pre presumably take over the fort, they decide to stay there and help out. So they remain at the fort. St. Ledger's main force would arrive the next day, August the 2nd, uh, too late to take the fort. And even though he's got artillery coming up, it hasn't come up yet. So they're held up, the artillery, by a very useful tactic employed by Peter Gansford. Gansford is the guy who's in charge, in command of Fort Stanwix. He sends his men out to chop down trees across the road that St. Ledger's artillery has to take to get to the fort. So, of course, St. Ledger and his guys have to slow down in order to move the trees off the road and make way for the artillery. So, <clears throat> this occupies all but 250 of St. Ledger's men. So, the majority of his force is being employed to move these trees off the road. The actual encirclement of Fort Stanwix, the surrounding of the fort, is done by the Native Americans. So, uh, St. Ledger is being held up. He's got about 2,000 men, all total, to see the Mohawk Valley. And on August 6th, he meets the rebel and Indian force at the Native American village called Oriska, which is present-day Oriskany. Now, to digress a little bit, Oriskany is called Oriskany today because later on in history, when people wrote letters or something to their relatives on Oriska, they would put Oriska and why so they would know it was in the colony of New York, and eventually that got combined to a Okay, Just a little tidbit. So, Peter Gansford is appointed by Philip Schuyler, who's the commander of the Northern Department of the American Colonies of New York, uh, to become the commander of the fort at Fort Stanwix. Um, he, um, Gansford, is to rehabilitate the fort and to stop us to step in to defend the fort against any British movements. Now they rename it Fort Schuyler after Philip Schuyler. Stanwix was the name of a British officer who had, who had begun the fort. We still call it Fort Stanwix today, though technically the official name is Fort Schuyler. Okay. So the 3rd New York Regiment, under the command of Gansford, goes there and they start to rehabilitate the fort, rebuild it, to put up new uh, breastworks, dig a moat, put up abatis, which are like, you know, stakes to keep the infantry from getting in there. And they start doing this in May of 1777. They officially renamed this fort Fort Schuyler. Now about six miles from the fort, um, closer to Oriska, the road dipped about 50 feet into a marshy ravine that's about three feet wide, okay? And two Seneca war chiefs, the San Quindaca and Corn Planter, uh, chose this place to set the ambush that they were going to uh, have. So the King's Royal Yorkers, these are the Americans who were loyals, waited behind the nearby rise. The Indians concealed themselves on both sides of the ravine and the plan was for the Yorkers to stop the head of the column, or Herkimer's column, as it came into the ravine, after which the Indians would attack the extended column. About 10 in the morning, this is August 6th, the column with Herkimer on horseback near the front descends into the ravine, crosses the stream, and begins to go up the other side. But of course, the ravine is surrounded by like three of four sides by the Indians, and the British and the American Loyalists. So the American and Loyalist force ambushed Herkimer's force in the small valley about six miles east of Stanwix near the present day Oriskany, which at the time was the village of Oriska. And if you go there today, there's a marker that says ambush started here. So the Indians near the end of the column opened fire with their muskets. They, the Americans are taken completely by surprise and Ebenezer Cox, who was the one who, remember, was making the racist remarks, so Herkimer kicked him out of the conference at Unadilla, he's shot from his horse almost instantly and killed. 
Herkimer turns on his horse to see what's going on, to see the action, and starts directing his troops, but shortly thereafter, he's struck in the leg by a musket ball. It shatters his leg and kills his horse. So he come, gets off his horse, which is dead, carried by several officers to, officers to a beech tree where men urge him to retire. He defiantly replies, quote, I will face the enemy, unquote, and sits leaning against the tree, smoking a pipe and giving directions to the men nearby about where they should go, what they should do. Now, the people at the end of the column, the Loyalists and the Indians, had sprung the trap too early, so only part of the column had reached the ravine, so part of it was being ambushed, part wasn't. Okay? Most of the men who weren't being ambushed, uh, ambushed panicked and fled. Some of the Indians went in pursuit, and the resulted, resulting string of dead and wounded extended for several miles from the, the ravine. Now, the, between the loss of the column rear and those killed or wounded in the initial volleys, only about half of Herkimer's men were still fighting about a half hour into the battle. Some attackers, uh, those not armed with muskets, waited for the flash of the opponent's musket fire uh, before rushing to the attack. This way they could tell where the Americans were, and they didn't risk getting shot themselves. This was highly effective against men who did not have bayonets because they had to stop to reload, uh, whereas they could use their bayonets as stabbing weapons, right? So Louis uh, Atearanta, who was a Mohawk who was with Herkimer's men, shot one of the enemies whose fire had been devastating in their accuracy, noting, quote, every time he rises up, he kills one or more of our men, unquote. So, uh, Lewis had dispatched him, and that sniper was no longer a problem. Herkimer's men, under his direction, eventually rallies, and the fighting out of the ravine to the moves out of the ravine to the crest. John Johnson returned to the British camp to re request reinforcements shortly before a thunderstorm breaks out. Now, seventy men head back to the fort uh, during the battle. The thunderstorm creates a one-hour break in the fighting during which Herkimer is given time to regroup on higher ground. Now the shooting stops because you can't fight during a thunderstorm. It dampens the powder in your musket. You know that old phrase, keep your powder dry kind of thing? During this lull, Herkimer regroups and he tells his men, don't fight singly now, fight in pairs, fight back to back. That way they can't sneak up on you which is something that was happening during the first round of the fighting. So while one arm is, a man is fired, uh, has fired and reloaded, the other waited only to fire if attacked. Okay? So one guy in front is shooting at the enemy, the other one is waiting to be attacked from behind, and if the attack comes, they can shoot at the guys who come up from behind. Then they're ordered to fire in relays, pairs trying to keep at least one weapon loaded and ready to fire at a time. So while one man is, uh, fires, he hands his weapon to the guy behind him to reload, and then the guy behind him uh, gives an already loaded weapon to the man who's shooting at the enemy coming from the front. So it's like a relay thing. Okay? During the battle, Han Yeri, who's one of the Oneidas um, Mohawks fighting with Herkimer, has his wife with him. His wife's name is Toya John Anega, and she is working in tandem with him. She is loading the rifle, handing it to him. He's shooting while she's reloading another musket. As soon as he's done shooting, she takes the empty musket, hands him the loaded one, and she loads, and they do this together. As far as we know, she's the only woman to take part in the Battle of Oriskany. Now, John Butler, the leader of the British regulars, takes time during the storm to, cap, uh, to question some captives that he's taken and learns about the three cannon signal. How, you know, if the relief column is coming, uh, they're going to fire, and Gansmore knows about it, uh, they're going to fire the cannon, but of course they never did this. So Butler tells the uh, uh, rangers to turn their frock coats inside out and pose as the relief column coming to relieve the fort, figuring that way he can trick the guys from the fort into think, to opening up the fort. 
So the rain ends, they resume the, the fight, Johnson and the Royal Yankees join the battle, but their ploy to disguise themselves doesn't work because one of the Patriot, one of the American militiamen, recognizes his neighbor as one of the British troops and he points this out to Herkimer and says, hey, they're British, they're not on our side. So British, the, the British plan does not work, okay? By this time, the battle's a close combat, combat sometimes hand-to-hand -hand between neighbors. It's truly a battle of brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, friend against friend. And it continues for some time, but hands, uh, tomahawks, spears, bayonets, rocks, you name it, okay? Brant's warriors begin to lose the advantage because of Herkimer's new tactics, okay, of, you know, the paired up fighters. Now, meanwhile, the storm has passed. In the fort, Marinus Willett, the second in command, kicks 250 men, and they leave the fort, and they raid the British camps south of the fort. They drive away the few British and Indians left in the camps, including the women, take four prisoners, collect whatever possessions they can get, blankets, pots, ammunition. They raid John Johnson's camp also, take his letters and all of his writings, which includes a letter from Ganswort to his fiancée, Catherine Van Shake. So they get Ganswort's letter back. Now one of the Indians who guards the camp runs over to the battlefield to alert the uh, warriors that they're being raided and looted. The Indians disengage and they head for the camp to protect the women and their possessions, right? This forced a smaller number of the Loyalist and Jaeger or German troops to also withdraw and go back to their camp to make sure their camp is safe. The battle costs the Patriots, the whole battle, approximately 450 casualties, or half their force. The Indians and Loyalists <coughs> lose approximately 150 dead and wounded, or about 50%, including 60 Indians. St. Ledger decides this is not a good idea, so he recalls his men, and they settle in to continue the siege of the fort, and then sends them another demand to surrender. The Americans say no. So it's a bad outcome, this battle is, for the Iroquois. It marked the beginning of a civil war between the five or six nations, between the ones who supported the Americans and the one who supported the British. The Almighty's under Colonel Lewis and Han Yeri allied with the Americans. Most of the warriors of the other Iroquois ally with the British, the Mohawk, the Seneca, the Cayuga, and the Onondaga. The Tuscarora ally with the Indians, or with the Americans. Each nation, of course, is uh, decentralized. There's big division between the Indians now, and many of them migrate to Canada as allies of the British. The site now, Oriskany, is known by the Iroquois nation as, quote, a place of great sadness, unquote, because that's where their nation broke apart. And here I found a marker to Hanieri, uh, where he was buried. The remnants of Herkimer's force retreat back to Fort Dayton, which is pro, uh, present day Herkimer. And while the Indians retrieve most of their dead, the following day many dead and wounded patriots are left on the field where they fell. Now what happened to Herkimer? Remember he got wounded during the battle. They carry him home and William Petrie, who is a brigade surgeon, dress his wounds in the field. It quickly becomes infected, because remember back then medical treatment was not that great. They make the decision to amputate his leg because uh, it's 10 days before he can get treatment. And it's performed by Robert Johnson, who's an inexperienced surgeon because the normal surgeon, Petri, was wounded during the battle, so he's not available. His wound, Herkimer's wound, ble bleeds profusely. And he dies August 16th, age 49, 10 days after the battle. Now, this battle is a real oddity and one of the few, one of the few battles in the Revolutionary War in which almost all the participants were North Americans. Uh, the Loyalists and the Native Americans fought against Patriots and other Native Americans. Very few of the British regulars took part. So what happens? St. Ledger declares a victory uh, in a British victory because he stopped the American Relief Column. But the Americans, however, remained in control of the battlefield and the fort, which was the object. 
to get the fort. Right? The British victory is tempered by the discontent of the Indians also. They had been told that the majority of the fighting would be done by the British horses. The Indians were the dominant fighters in the action. Okay? Some suffered the loss of personal belongings, also stolen by Willett and his forces when they went out and raided the Indian camp. While the Americans held the field of battle, they threatened, uh, retreated, because of the heavy casualties, including more, the mortal wounding of Herkimer. So it really wasn't a victory either, even though they did hold on to the fort. It was kind of a, a neutral thing. Okay? So what did the British do? The British sent a third surrender demand because they made up a story that General Burgoyne was in Albany. Not true. General Burgoyne was still hacking his way through northern New York, trying to get to Albany, and a month after the Battle of Oriskany, he would be stopped at the first Battle of Saratoga. Um, he also threatened in this note that the Indians, his allies, would be uh, turned loose on any Mohawk Valley community that remained loyal to the British, uh, or to the Americans, and everybody slaughtered. This is what he's telling Gansport. Willett says, gets together with Gansport, and they say, no, we're not going to surrender. Gansport lets Willett read uh, the note sent by uh, St. Ledger, and he sends back, Willett does, a written response. Quote, by your uniform you are British officers. Therefore, let me tell you that the message you have brought is a degrading one for a British officer to send, and by no means reputable for a British officer to carry. Unquote. Uh, right after Riskany, Willett and another officer slips through the British lines down to Fort Dayton, Herkimer, and uh, asks for a relief column to be sent to Fort Stanwix. Uh, other officers disagreed. They wanted to keep the army intact north of Albany to fight against Burgoyne. Okay? So, an American officer agrees, volunteers, to take a relief to the fort. His name was Benedict Arnold. Okay? Willett learns, when he gets to Fort Dayton, that Arnold has already been dispatched to a second relief force to Fort Stanwix. Okay? So he's, they've kind of passed uh, by the way, if you will, one going one way, one going the other. Now, Benedict Arnold had wanted to enlist in the militia when he was a young kid, but his mother refused permission. But he finally did enlist when he was 16 in the Connecticut militia, but served only 13 days, and the commonly accepted story was that he deserted. He established himself as a pharmacist and a book seller in New Haven, Connecticut, bought three trading ships and established a lucrative West Indies trade, operated ships on the Atlantic Ocean when the war began, then joined the Army. Uh, he uh, was responsible for delaying tactics at the Battle of Valcor Island on Lake Champlain, which is largely thought to be, if you will, the beginning of the U.S. Navy. Uh, he took part in the Battle of Richfield, Connecticut, was a member of the Sons of Liberty, and like many merchants, became a smuggler during this Revolutionary War to get his goods uh, to the colonies, assisted in the Siege of Boston, and proposed a, the seizure of Fort Ticonderoga and was a participant when Ethan Allen did capture Fort Ticonderoga with his Green Mountain Boys before the Revolution. Okay. So, Congress authorized an invasion of Quebec on the urging of Arnold, and he served as a military commander of Montreal until they were forced to retreat. That's the American forces. Washington assigned Arnold to the defense of Rhode Island, and he spent much of the winter socializing in Boston. He was a big social party guy. In 1777, he was passed over for promotion to Major General, and he wanted to resign, but General Washington refused Arnold's request. He's promoted to Major General, again, uh, finally, wrote another letter, a letter of resignation, and Washington again refused Arnold's resignation, and ordered him north to assist with the defense there. So on August 10th, Arnold leaves Stillwater, uh, which is near Saratoga, actually where the battle was fought, not in Saratoga, with 600 men of the Continental Army, and re expects to recruit men from the Tryon County Militia, where he goes on August 21st, but he could only raise 100 volunteers, because many of them had been at Fort Stanwix and Oriskany and said, no, we're not going back there again. 
He still had a thousand troops and resorted to subterfuge because he wasn't quite sure how many men the British had. So he had uh, staged an escape of a Tory and a loyalist named Hanyo Schuyler. He tells Schuyler, you will be executed for recruiting British soldiers unless you make a deal. So what is the deal? Hanyos is to convince St. Ledger that Arnold is coming with a much larger force than he actually had. Schuyler does this. He goes to St. Ledger and tells him that this huge overwhelming force is coming. Brant, the Mohawk leader, hears this, and the rest of St. Ledger's Indians withdraw. They leave and take most of the remaining supplies with them. St. Ledger lifts the siege of Fort Stanwich before Arnold arrives on August 24th. He's forced St. Ledger to go back through Oswego to Quebec. So St. Ledger uh, goes back to Canada. Brant and Sayan Quaracta uh, propose to continue fighting downriver towards German flats, but they decide not to. Brant's Mohawks raided and burned the Oneida settlement of Ariska, so they burn Ariskany now instead. In retaliation, the Oneidas plunder the Mohawk castles, castles of Ticonderoga and Canajo Harry. Now, <clears throat> in present day New York, if you see any kind of town like Oneida Castle that has castle in the title, that at one point had been a Native American village. Okay? So Brant and his men later raid Fort Hunter and prompted most of the remaining Mohawks in central New York to flee to Quebec. Now, according to a <coughs> mid-19th century account, Brant's Indians were said to have tortured and eaten their prisoners, but we have no, no historic uh, evidence to back this up. It was probably just propaganda. Okay? Butler reported four prisoners held by the Indians were afterward killed. We do know that some prisoners were killed, but, you know, again, it might be propaganda. Now, Arnold... Uh, augmented by some friendly Indians, advanced about 10 miles towards Stanwix on August 23rd. A messenger from Gansport notifies him that St. Ledger has left, and he reaches the fort that evening of August 23rd. Next day, the 24th, he leaves with, uh, well, he goes and attaches 500 men to pursue St. Ledger, whose column is, you know, retreating towards Oswego. An advanced party reached the shores of Oneida Lake just as the last of St. Ledger's boats were departing, and they, they leave, so the Indians and the men who were sent to chase St. Ledger return and go back uh, to Fort Stanwix, and now that they know that Stanwix is safe, Arnold and about 1,200 of his men go back to rejoin the army at Saratoga. Now, Major General Israel Putnam, who had been down in Peekskill, had gotten word from General Washington to go up to Fort Stanwix to, uh, to reinforce them. So they already are on guard duty in the Mohawk Valley, so they go towards Fort Stanwix and find out the siege was lifted, and they turn around and they go back down the valley. So what did the defenders of Fort Stanwix accomplish? Well, they withheld a three-week siege by the British, the Germans, and the Indians. They denied three surrender demands. Gansvort received the grateful thanks of Congress. Today, that's like giving the Medal of Honor. John Adams noted, quote, Gansvort has proven that it's possible to hold a fort, unquote. Marinus Willett was characterized as, quote, one of the truly outstanding American leaders of the Revolution, unquote. St. Ledger, from August 27th, writes to Burgoyne from Oswego that he intended to join him at Lake Champlain and to assist him, but by this time it's too late. Burgoyne has already lost at Saratoga. Now, the Stars and Stripes, the American flag. The Congress had adopted a resolution on June 14, 1770, quote, resolved that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternate with red and white, that the Union be 13 stars, white on a blue field, representing a new constellation, unquote, meaning the country. There was a delay in displaying this flag. The revolu resolution was not signed by the Secretary of Congress until September 3rd, 1777, though it had been printed in the newspapers. Now, the Massachusetts reinforcements that came to Stanwix in August 
uh, and reinforce them, brought news of the adoption of the official flag. So what happens? The so soldiers cut up their shirts to make white stripes. Scarlet red material is secured from a red flannel petticoats of the officers' wives. And the blue union is secure, secured from Captain Abraham Swarthout's blue coat. Okay. So they sew this together based on what they know from what this flag is supposed to look like. So uh, the first official United States flag was flown during the siege of Fort Stanwix in 1777. It was not done by Betsy Ross. There is no historical proof that Betsy Ross ever had anything to do with the American flag. She was an upholsterer, and she did make flags, but she didn't make that one. Okay, so what happens to Fort Stanwyck? After the siege, there was little action for it. Um, it was a dangerous outposting uh, because of regular harassment by loyalists and Indians in the area. So in 1779, the Continental Army used it as a staging ground for the destruction of Onondaga Castle. In 1788, the garrison was blockaded for several days by Indians led by Joseph Brandt. A year later, a flood and a fire, most likely arson, destroyed the fort and the Americans evacuated it. It was eventually destroyed for good in the 19th century, the 1800s. It was designated a U.S. National Monument in 1935, though the land itself was occupied by private businesses and residences in downtown Rome. Okay. 1961 is designated as a National Historic Landmark. In 1966, it was added, the site was added to the National Register of Historic Places. And the fort was reconstructed in the 1970s by the National Park Service. So when you go to Fort Stanwix today, the, the fort you see there is a reconstruction. It's not the actual fort though it is reconstructed to actual diagrams and is on the right place. It's in the actual place where the fort was. It was created as a national, uh, the Fort Stanwix National Monument. Now as a little historic aside here, um, Herman Melville, the famous American author who wrote Moby Dick, was the maternal grandson of Peter Gansford, who was the commander of Fort Stanwix during the siege. And Mark Felt, the FBI agent who was known as Deep Throat during the Watergate uh, investigations, the contact that Woodward and Bernstein used during the whole thing, was a descendant of General Nicholas Herkimer. Okay. So if you go there today, they have, there's the battlefield you can visit. They have a monument looks a lot like the Washington Monument in uh, Washington, D.C. There's an historic mark marker there about the battle. And the battle was also further immortalized by the United States Navy. Uh, that at one time they had a tradition of naming their aircraft carriers after famous battles of the Revolutionary War, like the USS Yorktown, the Lexington, the Saratoga, and the USS Oriskany. So I want to thank you, and I hope maybe you've learned a little something about what many historians consider the most pivotal battle of the Revolutionary War, because it did take place before Saratoga, a month before. Thank you.